to welcome in our good friend Ryan Wilson, also Peter Frisco, guys. We're almost there. We are almost there. I know Pete's excited. Ryan's got to get to Cleveland. Uh, so let's go through Ryan Wilson's latest mock draft. Obviously, we start with Trevor Lawrence, number one overall. Odds now 10, 000, or minus 10,000, I should say. Pete, I want to go with you on this because when Joe Burrow went to the Bengals, you predicted like a thousand Super Bowls. Give me your prediction just this next season of Trevor Lawrence and the Jags. They're going to win six, seven, eight games. I think they're going to be one of those teams that's going to be better than people anticipate. Urban Meyer's a good coach. He's one of those guys that knows how to build a program, and uh, he built a good staff. And Trevor Lawrence changes the outcome of that franchise for the next decade. They're relevant. They're going to win a Super Bowl in the next 10 years. There, I said it. <laughs> This is fun because, right, Joe Burrow is going to win a couple Super Bowls. Now Trevor Lawrence is going to win a couple Super Bowls. But I think Pete is actually right about something. Like, they should be able to win seven games next year, maybe eight in what is now a 17-game season, only because we saw that happen last year with Justin Herbert and the Chargers. And Justin Herbert, if you're looking for a comp, feels a lot like what Trevor Lawrence should be in year one. Do I think Trevor Lawrence will be that successful? I don't. But if he's 75% of what we see from Justin Herbert in 2020, that's a huge success uh, in the eyes of of what the Jaguars are looking for in a franchise quarterback. We know they've struggled to find one in recent years. Blaine Gabbert, Blake Bortles, those guys haven't worked out as first-round picks. But if you win seven games next year, then the expectation is you've got to go to the playoffs the year after that. And, and there are no excuses. And Pete has said this before. Uh, if, if you can't have success with uh, Trevor Lawrence and all those draft picks that you have coming in the top 100 picks, then maybe Urban Meyer isn't the guy. We'll find out pretty quickly. He's had success everywhere he's been. He's never coached uh, at the NFL level. But he has the best player in this draft, and he has a lot of tools around him to make that organization better. And the division, by the way, that's not great. So there are a lot of reasons for, for optimism, but it starts with the franchise quarterback. Uh, the, the Jaguars are optimistic when they got Blake Bortles and Blaine Gabbard. Uh, they hope this time that it works out in terms of their franchise quarterback. So both Pete and Ryan predicting seven to eight wins for the Bengals next season. And of course, uh, comparing Trevor Lawrence to Justin Herbert, we will pat Pete Briscoe on the back. He was right about that. All right, let's go to the Jets at number two, taking Zach Wilson. And that's who you have them taking, Ryan. That's who everybody has them taking. Ryan, you and I talked about this a couple days ago. Is there any chance the Jets would not take Zach Wilson? I mean, don't you think we would have heard some rumblings if that wasn't the case? That's the thing. We haven't heard anything about this, but I will give Pete credit in his what should happen mock draft that came out on Tuesday. He had Justin Fields going there, and that's a fair question to ask, Amanda. We haven't really, we just assumed that, okay, no one's saying anything. Everyone's focused on Matt Jones and, and Justin Fields and, and whether they're going to go three or wherever, and we've sort of forgotten about Zach Wilson. He's been hiding in, in Trevor Lawrence's shadow, so to speak, at that number two pick. Uh, we haven't heard anything from the Jets. Uh, it seems like on the reports we do hear from here and there that, that Jack, Zach Wilson is going to be that guy, but I don't think it's crazy to ask why could couldn't it be Justin Fields, given how good Justin Fields was during the season? But Zach Wilson came back from a 2019 season that when you talk to NFL teams, they pretty much said, man, he, he was just a guy, uh, had some injury concerns, but came back in 2020 and absolutely balled out and made himself took sort of that Joe Burrow path to uh, out of nowhere to right at the top of the draft. We'll see if that translates to the next level like he did for Joe Burrow. But the Jets, again, we talk about the Jaguars, the Jets have to find a quarterback, and they have not been successful at that in recent years. Mark Sanchez had some success early on, but that's because they had a running game. Sam Darnold had no success in part because there was nothing to help him. We'll see if Zach Wilson with a new coaching staff can find success early in New York. All right, 49ers at three. Ryan has them taking Mac Jones. Uh, I will note yesterday's odds were minus 200. Earlier today, it was minus 350. Now it is minus 400. So just skyrocketing as that favorite. Pete, w when we begin this process, I mean, just even a couple months ago, you said you were talking to teams and they were like, Mac Jones, second rounder, third rounder potentially. What's changed and do you think he will go to the 49ers? I do think he will go to the 49ers, and what changed is Kyle Shanahan's enamored with him. And now when one coach like that becomes enamored with a guy, everybody in draft Twitter cult goes back and does the reevaluations and says, you know what? I see what Kyle Shanahan sees. I love Mac Jones, even though two months ago I didn't love him. And that's basically what it is. And I'm not talking about Ryan, because I give Ryan credit. He liked him a lot right from the get-go. He's one of the few who did. Now everybody's gotten in line to follow what Kyle Shanahan thinks. Look, Kyle Shanahan's a hell of a coach. He really is. And he's got a great offensive scheme. But... 
There are times in his career where the quarterback has just been average at best, and he hasn't really won a lot. I mean, go back and look. And how many times has his offense been in the top ten? Three, I think, in his career. And that's counting him being an offensive coordinator. Look, he's a great coach. Don't get me wrong. But just because he likes Mac Jones doesn't mean everybody else has to. And I'm not one of them. I think he's a he should go in the middle of the first round. That's where I pegged him all along. I think you trade two first-round picks to go up and get Mac Jones. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what. I wouldn't want to be Kyle Shannon hand for the next 10 years. Yeah, and, and Pete's right about that. Not only would you not want to be Kyle Shanahan, you may not want to be Mac Jones because that's a ton of pressure going to a situation where you've basically been set up to fail. The fan base, by and large, hates the idea of Mac Jones going there, with the, especially with Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence almost certainly still on the board. And, and I get all that, and that's a fair argument to have. That's a lot to give up for any player, especially when we're talking about a, a volatile quarterback position where it, you have no idea which one of these guys is going to work out. At the end of the day, Kellen Mond might be the best quarterback in this draft class, including Trevor Lawrence. We just don't know. That's how uh, unpredictable finding these quarterbacks are. And, and Pete's exactly right. Like, for as great as a coach as Kyle Shanahan is, he's made some questionable personnel decisions. And, look, if he loves this guy and he thinks it's going to work, and we've seen him make it work with, with quote-unquote, lesser talents, then I get that. And, and I don't buy the idea that Jimmy Garoppolo and Mac Jones are the same person. I think we've seen times where uh, Shanahan has been frustrated with what uh, Garoppolo has not been able to do in those games. And, of course, there's the injury concerns. But I'll just say this, Amanda. I'm just glad we're still alive, and hopefully by Sunday we're all still alive, no matter what happens, based on what Kyle Shanahan said yesterday. I mean, the most doomsday ever. Who knows if we'll be alive by Sunday. Uh, and talk about the pressure. I mean, he said in that press conference, we are looking for our next starting quarterback. Uh, so a lot riding there if it is on Mac Jones's shoulders. All right, let's go to the Falcons at four. Ryan has them taking Kyle Pitts. If he is taken here, who will be the highest tight end ever drafted? in this position. Nobody's ever gone higher than five. Pete Prisco, the Falcons could do a couple things. They could take a quarterback. They could trade out of this. Would it be in their best interest to take Kyle Pitts here? Yes, I would take Kyle Pitts here unless I got a real offer that wowed me and gave me a couple first-round picks or a first-round pick and a two or something to move down about five, six, seven spots. I would do that. Uh, but any other scenario, I'll probably taking Kyle Pitts. And people say, well, why won't you take the quarterback? Because I think Matt Ryan can still play at a high level. Uh, his contract makes sure that he's probably going to be there for the next two years. I hear the owner, Arthur Blank, is uh, tied to, to Matt Ryan and wants him around there. And that's why I think they're going to draft Kyle Pitts. And Kyle Pitts is a phenomenal tight end. Well, okay, phenomenal pass catcher. Uh, he improved as a blocker, but that's not what he does. He's a really a wide receiver playing tight end. In fact, I had a couple of receiver coaches tell me he should drop 10 pounds and become Calvin Johnson. That's how good he is outside. And you're talking here and talk about Julio Jones maybe going elsewhere. Why not get another big physical player outside your passing game? You will have Kyle Pitts on our show tomorrow, so make sure to tune in. Uh, you will also hear his cheesesteak order because that's a tease that everybody wants. All right, let's go to the Bengals at five. Ryan has them taking Panay Sewell. Now, Ryan, in your article, you know the Bengals may ultimately end up going with Jamar Chase here, but you like Sewell. Why? Yeah, I think it is going to be Jamar Chase by the time it's all said and done, Amanda. But I like Panay Sewell because here's the math you're doing. Do you want the best offensive tackle in this draft class, as most people view him, myself included? Uh, and then maybe in round two, get the fifth or sixth best wide receiver? Or do you want Jamar Chase, uh, the best wide receiver, and then circle back and get the seventh or eighth base? best uh, offensive tackle at that point with the whole idea of understanding that the reason that Joe Burrow didn't finish the season is because the offensive line couldn't hold up and he tore his ACL. I'm leaning on the side of protecting Joe Burrow. I know the sexy pick is Jamar Chase, but I would just point to last year. The Bengals got T. Higgins in round two. He had a great rookie season, uh, and they were able to address other needs in round one, namely Joe Burrow, at the top of that draft. So I think you just continue to build the offensive line. You can have Jonah Williams and Panay Sewell playing at tackle. You can kick Riley Reef inside, uh, who was signed this offseason, and you're on your way to improving that offensive line. I think much more so than if you waited to round two to get an offensive tackle just because you wanted to have Jamar Chase out there on the field. We find the Dolphins at six. They were at three. They went down to 12. Then they moved back up to six. Uh, so assuming they probably want to play America here, Ryan has them taking the guy we were just talking about, Jamar Chase. Um, Pete, no matter what happens, I mean, they could see Pitts here. They could see Sewell. They could see Jamar Chase here. Who do you like out of those for the Dolphins and how much, if it is Jamar Chase, could he elevate this offense? Well, well, let me say something about the Bengals and something I hear. I hear there's certain people in that building that want Panay Sewell and maybe Coach Zach.
Taylor and quarterback Joe Burrow want the wide receiver and Jamar Chase, who he played with at LSU. So there's an interesting split there. I would take Sewell if I were the Bengals. And if I'm the Dolphins and they do take Chase, I'm taking Sewell here and not Chase, uh, obviously, because he'd be gone. I think you get the big people. There's only so many giant players on this planet who can play offensive line and play it well in the NFL. So I get the attraction to Jamar Chase. I get it from Miami State. Standpoint. I get it from the Bengals standpoint, but this is a deep receiver class and you're talking about 20, 25 receivers who are going to be contributors in the NFL and there's a lot of fast guys as well. I would take the big guy. I probably, you know, I've said it all along. I think Christian Darisol will be the best tackle in this class. That's probably who I would take. But if I'm the Bengals or the Dolphins, I'd take Panay Sewell over Jamar Chase. All right, let's go to the Lions at seven. Um, both Justin Fields, Trey Lance still out there, but Ryan, you have them taking a receiver in Jalen Waddle. Why is that? I think this is the direction that the Lions are leading. So here's what, what are they thinking about? Brad Holmes just came over from the Rams where he was with Jared Goff, obviously. He's the new GM, Brad Holmes is. But the, so do they want to stick with Jared Goff, in which case you get him playmakers? Marvin Jones is gone, Kenny Galladay is gone. Or is Chris Spielman, who was in the front office in Detroit and has been there for some time, does he want to go the Ohio State route and, and get Justin Fields? So I think that's the, the uh, tension that's going to be uh, into the discussion uh, of who they take here. But if you're rolling with Jared Goff, please give him some playmakers. I mean, you could certainly take a, a Micah Parsons here, for example, or even an offensive tackle if you wanted to, but who's Jared Goff going to throw the ball to? So I, I'm assuming that the Lions feel like they should roll with Jared Goff. Uh, that organization has a lot to fix. They're not going to fix it with one player. And so they go with Jalen Waddle, who's a home run hitter, to give Jared Goff someone to throw the ball to down the field. All right, at eight, we find our next quarterback going off the board. Ryan, you have them selecting the Panthers. That is Justin Fields. So why Justin Fields to the Panthers and not Trey Lance? I'm with Pete. I think Justin Fields is a really good football player and probably deserves to be in the top two, three conversations. So Trey Lance, we haven't seen him play a bunch. He's played one game in the last 400 plus days. So th there are questions there. He hasn't thrown a bunch of passes when he has played. So what are the Panthers doing at eight? It feels like, and uh, we've heard conversations about that. Well, we know that they traded for Sam Darnold and they'll probably move on from Teddy Bridgewater, but Br uh, Darnold has yet to sign his fifth year option. That will probably happen. But again, if you're David Tepper, the owner in Carolina, and you want to win now, and we know that he wants to win now because he was was making a move for Deshaun Watson until things uh, heated up in Houston there off the field for Deshaun. What do you do if Justin Fields is right there on the board? Are you going to take a cornerback, which you desperately need, or are you going to think about taking a quarterback like Justin Fields? So I think that's still on the table, even though Sam Darnold is the quote-unquote near-term future. If you have a chance to take a, a Justin Fields and you love him, I think you do it here at eight. Uh, I suppose they could also entertain some trade-down possibilities, although I don't think they would want to move past somewhere in the middle of round one. Yeah, I would take Justin Fields here, but I don't know if they will. And, and the reason I say that is that you, you gave assets to go get Sam Darnold. Obviously, you think uh, when you were doing that, you weren't sure uh, of the guys that are in this spot. Because there was a chance Fields was going to be here. There was a chance Jones was going to be here. There was a chance that Lance would be here when you made that deal. And they uh, two of them would be. So I, I don't think that they will draft a quarterback. I think they might go in a different direction. I would draft Slater or Darisau in this spot if I were them to solidify the left tackle spot. Uh, but they could also go corner. You look at their corner situation, it's not pretty. So I think they pass on the quarterback because I've heard that they're not entirely enamored with this group of quarterbacks in this scenario. So and I would pass on the quarterback if I were them. All right, let's go to the Broncos at nine. Ryan has them taking Rashawn Slater. Um, Pete, Obviously, Panay Sewell is fantastic. How would Rashawn Slater fit in with the Broncos? And, and do you think he's that far behind Sewell? Yeah, he is from a tackle standpoint. I think this kid should move inside. I, I really believe, and we've looked at the history of this position at times. You know, Zach Martin was a college tackle, moved inside, became a dominant guard. Brandon Scherf was a college tackle, moved inside, became a dominant guard. And on and on it goes over the years. The guys that really have the shorter arms and aren't really tackles move inside, and they become forces. If I'm the Broncos and I picked him in this spot, I would move him inside the guard and watch how good he becomes as a player. Player because you know, their left tackle, Garrett Bowles, good player. He wouldn't play there. They have Jawan James at right tackle. He opted out. He had some problems and opted out. And I think that when you look at that, I think he should be a guard. But he's a good football player. I wouldn't take him to play left tackle if I were the Broncos, though, because they have Garrett Bowles. All right, at 10, we have a trade. 
And it's the Patriots trading up to 10 to take the Cowboys pick. Uh, the Patriots were at 10 for a quarterback. Ryan has them taking Trey Lance. Pete, what do you think about this potential trade? I think it's intriguing. I mean, you got to have to get a quarterback. Uh, they're all gone uh, except for Trey Lance, and he might not be there when you pick. So make a move to go get him. I'm okay with this. And you know what? He can spend the year behind Cam Newton, and, and the offense is kind of built to play to Cam Newton's strengths. It would be built to play to Trey Lance's strengths because he's a big physical guy who can run uh, and, you know, run with physical style as well. So uh, this would be a good move for the Patriots. I like it. I don't know if they necessarily have to do it. Uh, they might be able to get him in that spot unless somebody jumps up. But uh, I like the aggressiveness from Ryan Wilson. Yeah, so that's the thing. How far are these teams that need quarterbacks going to be willing to trade up? I mean, the Patriots could go conceivably from 15 to 4, but it's going to take a San Francisco-type haul in terms of giving up three first-round picks, most likely. So they wait around and see what happens, see Trey Lance falls, and once Justin Fields goes off the board, they make their move. And I think Pete, Pete's right. If the, the Patriots like just, uh, Trey Lance, uh, he feels like a successor to Cam Newton in that he's uh, sort of the same player and probably more advanced as a passer coming out of college, although, as I mentioned, he hasn't thrown a ton of footballs in the last year or so. But I think sitting on the bench is best-case scenario. We say this all the time, or perhaps we don't even say it enough. Uh, fit matters, and if you're going to go somewhere and sit, you'd rather do it uh, in New England, for example, as opposed to Detroit, where you have no idea what the organization will look like in a year. Uh, the Patriots spent all offseason upgrading every single position except quarterback, so this feels like their last remaining need. Uh, they can certainly go in another direction here, but if they get a quarterback in the first round, I can't imagine anyone would be surprised by that. We'll see if Bill Belichick consults his dog in this one. Nike, I believe that's the name. We'll see if we see it, this draft. All right, you guys hang on just a second. Uh, coming up, everybody has an opinion when it comes to the corners in this draft. A couple teams out there battling for them where they all land on Ryan Wilson's mock draft. Next. Welcome back into CBS Sports HQ. We are going through Ryan Wilson's latest and second to last mock draft. Taking a look at one through 10. This is a three rounder, by the way, if you want to check it out on CBSSports.com. So three quarterbacks off the board immediately. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Mac Jones, then Kyle Pitts goes at four. Both Ryan and Pete Frisco like that, followed by Panay School and then Jamar Chase to the Dolphins. Um, Pete says if Panay Sewell, for some reason, is there at six, though, that is who he would take over Jamar Chase. Let's welcome back in our guys, Ryan Wilson, Pete Frisco. Let's keep going through this. Let's go to the Giants at 11. Couple things here. Dave Gettleman says he doesn't like trading down. We also know that he likes drafting big guys. Both of you, in your latest mocks, have the Giants taking Devontae Smith. So, Pete, I want to start with you here. Why would he be a good fit for them? Well, one, I hear that they love him. I hear Dave Gettleman loves Devontae Smith and, and really needs to add a big play threat outside. They don't have that in their offense. And Darius Slayton's an interesting player, but getting a guy like this to help Daniel Jones and that offense grow would make a lot of sense. Now, it does buck a lot of trends. I mean, let's be real. Dave Gettleman normally doesn't like picking skill players. He wants to pick big people. And so I still think there's a possibility edge rusher could be in play here. I hear they like Aziz Ojo. Jalari from Georgia maybe in this spot, which would be a, a little high for him, but it would fill a major need. Having said all that, Devontae Smith also fills a big-time need for Daniel Jones. Yeah, Pete's right. It goes against every instinct you have when you talk about Dave Gettleman picking in the first round because he always takes big offensive tackles, big uh, defensive tackles, and even he, his wide receivers he takes in the first round are big guys. Kelvin Benjamin back in Carolina was a big was a big wide receiver. So Devontae Smith weighs 166 pounds, and it doesn't make sense. But it does make sense, and that, that's exactly what Daniel Jones needs. I would love to see this happen. I'm still skeptical, but I just wonder if in the 11th hour, uh, Dave Gettleman's going to get cold feet and go back to what he knows.